I'm Rob Sanderson, uh, the semantic architect for the J. Paul Getty Trust, and so a brief digression into semantic architect. Um, so I'm responsible for the overall semantics, the data modeling, um, across all of the programs within the, um, the Getty. So the uh, Observation Institute, the Research Institute, the Museum, Foundation, Publications, Getty Digital, and, uh, and so on. Uh, meaning that I'm, as I was saying before, I'm unlikely to put myself out of a job by being too successful, uh, in that we always have more and more knowledge to integrate across the systems. And this really comes back to Vanessa's point in his very first slide about we have the catalogue, which in our institution is, of course, operated by the museum, and we have conservation, uh, which also is in the museum, but for us, uh, also in conservation science, a completely different program who has had a history of not working with the museum, even though we share a building. Uh, and the Research Institute, of course, has uh, information about conservation, information about objects, information about provenance. Again, same building, and we have not had a history of working together. So what we are trying to do uh, is to put together the puzzle pieces in a way that makes sense. Um, and not enable us to do better research and better serve the community. So this presentation uh, is about one part of that work, um, about uh, DISCO. So um, the data integration for conservation science, yes, you need to jumble your mind up a little bit to get the background about. Um, and it is definitely a, well, a game with two halves with an interminable overtime where we're all waiting for the whistle to blow and the end. And so first I'll talk about uh, some of our philosophy and um, the way that we are doing uh, this work, uh, which we call Linux Art. Then we'll look at some models. So thank you to George for giving such a great introduction to the overall modeling. We'll go a little bit further down uh, in, in my part. And then the overtime is looking at how we've implemented this, or how we are in the process of implementing it, um, using Arches uh, and, uh, and Disco. <coughs> uh, so, to start with, um, some of the philosophy. So we um, think about standards first and foremost. Um, without standards we can't interoperate, as George said. Uh, we can't put our puzzle pieces together, uh, because we won't be able to connect from the description of the object in the museum catalogue to the description of the conservation actions um, either in the museum or in um, the Conservation Institute. So we want to, we have this vision of a connected world, not just an institution, um, where we can connect um, our catalogue and our, our data to the data at the Library of Congress, to data here, and to data at different institutions um, regardless of uh, where uh, they might be. In order to do that, we as a community um, need to agree about some basic um, standards, some basic tools that we'll use such that we're at least speaking in the same language to some degree. As we were just talking about, it doesn't mean that we all have to pick exactly the same level of specificity um, about our use of language, but we need to all be speaking somehow uh, in the same way. Uh, so there are some benefits to doing this, because there is, of course, a cost to that agreement. So the benefits then, um, we can share um, models across different institutions that still allow us to have um, our own institutional expertise encoded in a similar way. So we're not trying to simplify everything, dumb things down. Um, we're trying to make it such that if uh, at the interoperability layer, when we want to communicate, we can go up that hierarchy to say, oh, it wasn't just transferred title of, you know, maybe we don't understand provenance as well uh, in some situations, oh, but we do understand that it was carried out by, or that they had a participant. Um, we can reduce our implementation costs uh, with shared expertise uh, and shared implementations. Um, so not only can we share software, but also there is, with any implementation work, a cost for documentation and decision making. So if we've all agreed up front, well, this is how we're going to do it, then we only need one set of documentation for the entire community, um, rather than everyone having to bear that cost. Um, so this is the third point. And then the last one, innovation is still possible. Um, it's not that everyone has to do things in exactly the same way and we are trapped. 
about it, I would say the opposite, that because of the um, open nature of, of language, we can always add extensions to say, here is a further sub-property uh, or a further subclass um, that allows us to innovate in interesting ways, but still tie back into this overall pattern and this overall language. So this is the, um, the way that the Getty is going. Um, in terms of our, our strategic information knowledge integration um, approach. So to go further in, one of the uh, aspects of that work is uh, a project uh, called Linked Art. Um, it's funded, uh, which I'll get to in a little bit, by Chris and AHRC. So it's a, a clear project um, to this one. Uh, and our focus is on the catalogue side rather than on the conservation side. So we want to um, describe um, artworks, which of course includes at least some notion of conservation, but the focus is on the, the object and, and its activities. Um, it's a linked, open, usable data model. Um, I'll get to what that usable was doing there in a minute. Um, that we want it to be easy to publish uh, and to consume. Uh, so we want to make it easy for people to use it uh, rather than um, just to have something that is a, a standard. Um, so our design principles then we focus on usability as opposed to absolute precision, um, which of course means drawing a line somewhere and that's what all the discussion is about in the, uh, in the network. Um, to consistently solve challenges. So the, the, one of the lovely things about CRM is it's quite flexible and you can extend it to be even more flexible. But then you end up with very fragmented methods of description. So what we're trying to do is find an appropriate way and get agreement amongst the partners and to all describe things in a certain way given the same situation. So again, it's not to say everything must fit into this size box, it's that if you have something that fits into the size box, then use the box. Uh, and to solve 90% of the use cases rather than 100%, so there is things that we've sort of crossed out as being out of scope, uh, but with only 10% of the effort. Because what we found is everyone has a very good common subset of things that we need to talk about, and then everyone has something completely different. So we want to solve those common things jointly and allow the individual institutions to then innovate to say, and we have this particular expertise that we're going to layer on top. Now you can find out more at LinkedArt, which if you go, you'll see that it's quite a rough and ready uh, website. So please, <laughs> no comments on the, the HTML. Uh, but uh, yes, there is. Uh, work afoot to fix that. So who we are, um, so the, the work came out of a, um, some work that went on at the Getty uh, a couple of years ago, and that work came out of work that um, David Newbury and myself, uh, Manuel Delmas-Lass and a bunch of others were part of in the States called the American Art Collaborative, uh, where we came up with sort of the initial target model for how to use CRM to do this sort of stuff. We have subsequently expanded it to not just American art, and it was never clear whether it was American art collaborative or the American art collaborative. So the Yale Center for British Art is in the States, but it's not American art. But the focus of the work was American art, so the parentheses were never clear. So, uh, yeah, there's, you know, on the left side are mostly museums, <coughs> and so Getty, UX Museum, the Louvre, the Met, the Smithsonian, MoMA, uh, DNA, the Frick, and so on. Um, the right side are more uh, educational institutes, research institutes, so Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Oxford, um, should all be well known, fourth, of course, um, Zeri, and then a few networks, uh, so the Canadian Heritage Information Network, which um, is very similar to Europeana uh, here in Europe, so they aggregate information from Canadian museums, Europeana aggregates information from European cultural heritage institutions uh, and the American Numismatic Society. So they are very far ahead in using like data for, for this sort of thing, but they aggregate information about coins from within uh, the US. Uh, we have funding from the Chris Foundation uh, and from the AHFC, so we're uh, happy that we can also have similar uh, workshops and, and meetings. Um, and uh, as of last week, um, it's also great to be able to say, 
uh, that we have approval from CIDOC uh, and ICOM to have a special interest group uh, within CIDOC for linked art, separate from the uh, CRM SIG that defines the ontology. So the linked art SIG will be an application profile of the CRM defined within CIDOC um, for use in the art domain um, with you know, initial members such as this. So we are, we are happy that it's seen as beneficial um, and um, something that will be ongoing and, and not just project funded, a real program as opposed to a project. So then what do we, what, what are we trying to do or how are we trying to do it? So we have tried to um, focus on four, possible, four sort of techniques uh, for doing this work. Uh, that shared models are developed iteratively and that we know that we're not going to get it right the first time around because we won't be able to consider every single shared use case. Um, so we're going to have to change things. Um, the CRM evolves, so we're going to have to change things to um, stay in touch with the ontology. Uh, responsively, so we will adapt it in response to feedback. People we'll come and say, we tried to use it and we couldn't understand X. Clearly we need to fix the documentation, or perhaps the model needs to be, um, needs to be changed. But equally responsibly, that we're not just going to try and change things willy-nilly. Um, we want to make sure that we are doing the right thing um, for the community rather than um, uh, jumping at every single um, windmill. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, collaboratively, this is not just the Getty or any other institution saying, you will all do it our way, but we will do it our way. Um, and hence we need to ensure that there is the opportunity to participate uh, and give feedback and, and engage. So, what? Um, I want to start with a little bit of uh, background as to why we are doing linked open usable data. So everyone has data, and it's pretty easy to use by humans when you look at it in a tabular format. So this is just a screenshot of uh, an object on our website, and you, know, you can see that there is fields and there are values. So this is just data. It's pretty easy to use by humans. We can all understand by reading it what it means. Linked open data is easy to use by machines. Don't try and read this. This is the entire point of the slide. <laughs> that it's, you can't read it. It's, it's pretty much impossible to, um, to see what's going on here. But what it is, is the triples expressed in a machine-readable format of the previous slide. So what we are trying to do is make linked open usable data, which is usable by humans. So it's still data in that it's machine-readable. But if you look at this slide, if you squint a little bit, you can kind of see the same tabular structure as the first data slide. So ignore the top one. ID is a, an identifier for this thing. Type, it's a human-made object. Um, so that's the class. Uh, it's got a label. It has a type, which is an AAT term, and it's an M4. Uh, and so on. So, but easy to use by humans. Well, which humans are we talking about? You, people will find different things easy and not. So, am I, do I mean this researcher? <laughs> no, what I really mean is that there is this guy in the middle. That it should be easy to use by developers who are writing code to do something with the data. Because the researcher almost never, well, should almost never have to look at the raw data. They should be interacting with websites or other processed form of that. So what we're trying to do is well, money and data flows into the machine. The machine spits out these triple things in a form that the developer can understand in order to do his job, which is turn data into something that can be used by researchers and enthusiasts alike. Or another way of thinking about it, the API the application programming interface, or I like to think agreement preceding interaction, so we agree on how things should be described, uh, is the user interface of the developer in the same way that the developer creates a user interface for the researcher. Uh, and uh, as a New Zealander, 
I always hesitate to use uh, an Australian uh, principle. <laughs> but the Australians do in fact have it right this time, so I need to bite my tongue a little bit. Uh, when it comes to APIs, developers are your users. The same principles of user-centered design apply to the development and publication of APIs, such as simplicity, obviousness, fit, fit for purpose, etc. So they have it exactly right. This is, this is sort of our core principle in, um, uh, in linked art that the data needs to be simple, sim but as, as simple as possible and no simpler, uh, obvious, fit for purpose, and, and so on. Okay, on to the second half. Um, so, this is sort of a summary of George's overall view as well. Um, so from 50,000 feet, the model looks sort of like this. And if George and I have done our homework correctly, we'll even be using the same colors. <laughs> uh, so activities and events and etc. temporal things sit here in the middle. Um, they are the glue between the different classes. Um, and the and I think of it as uh, who, where, what, and when. So the activity happened when, it happened at a time span, so that's that P4 has time span property. Uh, who carried it out, who did it, who participated in it? Well, there's this actor, the uh, person or a group, so the, the intentional causality of the activity. Uh, where did it take place? Well, we did it take place, it took place at a place. Uh, and what uh, was involved in the activity? Either a physical object, or a conceptual information object. Um, and then pretty much everything uh, that we'll look at uh, for the conservation science project uh, fits into this pattern, or we have tried to take it and put it into this pattern, I would argue, reasonably successfully. So what sort of activities do we care to talk about? Um, in working with conservation scientists, uh, these were the ones that came up as being uh, most important, so sample removal, being taking a, taking a sample. Um, example production, uh, observation, comparison and measurement, experimentation and the actual conservation action, writing up the documentation, unfortunately a necessary evil, um, project and task management and group and collection management. So for the next part, I'll go through each of these and show how we have used that 50,000 foot model drill down to 10,000 feet and see how we've tried to approach it. Okay. So the overall model uh, looks like this. I'll talk through this and then we're going to drill down into the different sections. So on the top left we have a project um, which is say uh, the, the conservation of the Rembrandt paintings. Um, it's carried out by a group of people. That group can in fact only be one person. Um, normally it's more than one, and the group has members which are people. So if there are projects that are only carried out by one person, it is still actor, so you can jump straight from project to person, but almost always we would have the group in between. Then uh, it gets partitioned um, into other activities, so the project has a part which is a research activity. So typically um, we would have uh, questions as to um, what happens when, you know, as a terrible example, what happens if we put acetone on plastic? So we're going to have different experiments then, as uh, underneath research activities, which have, you know, we take this acetone and put it on that plastic, we put it on a different plastic, and we do all of the experiments to find out what happens in the different cases. So that would then be part of a larger plastic conservation project. Similarly, and this is where I like to think about this temporal entity versus physical entity. Um, if we partition temporal things, then we have different activities like that. If we partition a physical thing, then we have you know, a chair which has wheels and a seat and a back and so on. So the same way that George was saying, if you take a slice in time, if you have a temporal entity, you don't see any of its partitions, you only see the narrowest, thin bit of it. If you take a physical entity at a certain point in time, you can see all of its parts at one point. So then, um, projects 
use sets, and sets are conceptual. So this is a, just a set of objects, and I'll, we will not talk about <laughs> uh, exactly where this comes from in the model, because it's an exception. Um, so the set has members, which are objects. Uh, the objects have then parts, features, so the area of the object that we're taking a photograph of, uh, and samples, which are objects in themselves, in that they have been removed from um, the, the overall object. Samples can then be subsampled and sub 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 sampled, and hence we have this descending hierarchy. You can arbitrarily repartition areas within objects, and hence the same applies to area. We then have the sort of core activities uh, of observations. So we look at the physical thing or the digital representation of it uh, and come up with some information. We can measure it, uh, we can modify it, uh, and we can produce it at the top. We then also have creation of applications, which are then digitally carried by digital objects. Uh, and these things can use constraints. Right, clear as mud. Uh, so we'll go into more detail about each of those um, areas, but that's how it all sort of fits together. Okay, so sample removal. So we have an activity, the blue thing, which is someone removing a bit of an object in order to create a sample, put it under a microscope, and do, do whatever experiment on it, um, and so on. So we want to know, of course, when that occurred, its time span. We want to know who did it. Uh, we want to know which object was this was the parent object, which object was it removed from, and what is the sample itself so that we can track its identity separately from its parent. So here we have this same sort of pattern as um, uh, the transfer title of, uh, sorry, transfer title from, transfer title to. Here it's removed from and removed. Uh, so it, it uses both of those objects, but it uses them in a particular way. So it removes the sample from the overall object. Uh, and of course, just to reinforce this feature notion, uh, we have the, the part, the areas within an object that can't be removed. <coughs> so you don't remove a uh, feature or an area, uh, it just is. Also, um, we create artificial objects to do experiments on um, that sort of represent uh, the, the overall uh, work. So we want to be able to track production, um, either of the art object itself or of these artificial uh, representative samples. So that produ production can be partitioned and that more, more than one person can carry out different roles, different parts of the creation. It produces eventually an object, a human-made object. It uses specific tools. Um, it's carried out by a person or a group. It can use different techniques. Um, and it happens at a particular point in time. So we didn't really talk about types much, but one of, I would say, one of the important things in CRM is to link over to um, vocabularies. So the way that we manage uh, painting as a separate technique from sculpting uh, is via this type notion. This is where we would use AAT. So we would say the production of the painting used the technique of painting. And this is when controlled vocabulary comes <coughs> really handy because the painting was created by painting is a terrible English sentence. Yeah. But for a computer it's easy to understand. Or the sculpture was produced by an activity which is of type of sculpting. So we don't need to have a uh, ontological sort of class for IKEA table, or in fact even table. We can just use human-made object and say, it is of type AAT table, or AAT IKEA table, or AAT IKEA table SKU 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I don't think we'd do it ever to that level, but yeah, you get the point. Uh, Observation, comparison, and measurement. So, again, it's an activity. We want to know where it occurred, who did it, uh, but we want to know how they did it, a bit more specifically than just the technique. Um, so if you are carrying out a particular um, XRF 
stand of something, you want to know that you follow the particular standard operating procedure for using that particular instrument um, on that sort of object. So we have this notion of a conceptual object, which is the procedure that you follow to do something. And it used a specific, also physical thing, the um, handheld XRF scanner that you happen to, that is then owned by the organization and has this other information in it. Then, uh, again, we have further uh, conceptual things. So it observes some result or uh, some value. So that's a likely a digital representation that's coming out of the instrument, uh, but you can copy it. You can't hold that result in your hand, so it's, it's conceptual. And the observation observes one or more objects. Um, the nice thing about the CRM is that it's also very good at um, saying there can be one or more of these things, or exactly one, or zero to one. Um, so for observation, you can have a single observation that observes multiple things. And that would be a comparison. Uh, you can observe physical things, and you can observe conceptual things via some representation, such as uh, digital files. So if you have a scan of the object, and you actually do your work with that scan, rather than looking at the impossible to see with the human eye region, we can track that you actually looked at the scan, not that you looked at the, at the object itself. Uh, experimentation and conversation actions are typically modification, in that you change something about the physical object, and the same pattern applies. This is one of the things that we've tried uh, to focus on in the linked art modeling work, being consistent uh, in the way that we approach things. So a production using painting is modeled exactly the same way. It's a modification uh, of a, um, an object using, uh, and now I'm going over my head, the, the scratching modification of the chair that we're talking about. So uh, using the technique of scratching, he used the tool of his pocket knife, but George used the tool of his pocket knife to make the scratch on the chair. But that all fits into the same overall conceptual framework, and the patterns are the same. Meaning that we don't have to learn 16 million new things just for the difference between creating the chair and putting a script on it. It's all the same at the, at the baseline. So writing the report, I think, is possibly the, well, to me, the easiest way of understanding the physical conceptual difference in that the writing is creating a text, but that text is not necessarily physical. It's, you are almost certainly just typing it into a computer. You can't hold the text in your hand until you print it out. And that text can be carried by more than one file. It could be a PDF that was generated by uh, taking the Word document and exporting as PDF. So there's the one report text that's carried by multiple different files each of which could be printed out and generating physical things down here that we don't care to track because if you print out your report, great, you don't need to put it in the information system. Uh, again, the creation of the text happens at a particular time, it's carried out by a particular person. If we wanted to, we could track which computer you were using, would follow this you know, which technique, we'll follow the same thing. I think the important thing uh, for us is that the text can be about various things, in this case activities. So uh, it's uh, a report about the observations, what, and which eventually led by various procedures that it was about, to the modification of the object. Um, thus, when we come to generate this from a fully fleshed out implementation, we would say, generate me a report for, uh, for this project. It would go through all of the activities, find their descriptions, and pull them out, order them by time, separate them into the research activities, and lay out a report of here is what happened. And generate that as a Word document to then be exported and edited by someone. Rather than having to go through your physical lab notebook, if this is what they did when, we, the intent is that we'll be able to at least do the Heavy lifting of generating the template for that report um, uh, with the machine. 
So project and task management um, is really just the partitioning um, of the activities into sort of more meaningful chunks. So we have re uh, projects that consist of research questions, that consist of tasks or experiments. Those experiments are typically either, well, uh, either the production of an object or the removal of the part of an object to generate the thing that you want to, to look at. Then some observation or comparison, some probably some modification of it, and then eventually the creation of the text to describe what happened. And similarly, uh, group and collection management, the project and all the other activities are carried out by the group. The group has different members, but there is a specific role in which this person is uh, relative to the group, and that they might be the PI, or they could be the contact person, or they could be the individual contributor, they could be whatever. So we, and we want to track when they became part of the group, potentially also if they left the group. So we have an activity of joining a group. So again, the same pattern, we're putting any time we want to have a relationship with more information, we create an activity and associate the activity, associate the additional information with activity. So this would be joining in the role of principal investigator. So Thanasis joined the um, LCD network in the role of PI, and he joined it at a particular point in time. If you left, there would be a leaving activity where you left the group. And so Similarly, we have sets of objects, and objects are added to sets. They're added with the role of a principal object for research. They're added by a person. They're added at a particular point in time. You take it out, another activity, or removal uh, of, of the object from the set. OK, so that is half an hour, and now on to extra time, where I'll talk about our implementation. <coughs> so, first of all, um, I want to be clear <laughs> that uh, this is a work in progress. We've gotten through the modeling phase, um, at least to the point where we're comfortable starting to implement, um, but this is definitely a work in progress. Uh, so, we are using um, the Arches platform um, to, to build this information system. Um, I think this is from the Arches uh, homepage. Uh, the adjectives that Parallon, uh, the company that builds it, used to describe Arches are innovative, purpose built, open source, standards based, versatile, and community driven. So, I think all of those six are words that I've said already in this presentation, uh, which is why we find Arches so. <coughs> Uh, attractive. Maybe I didn't say open source, but um, it sort of comes under community. So standards based, it's built on top of CRM. Um, you can swap out the CRM for other ontologies and you can add extensions relatively easily. Which makes it versatile. Uh, it's community driven, that's super important to us. Uh, it's open source so you can contribute to it, and even if you don't contribute to it, you at least have everything that should barrel on go out of business, you could pay someone else to keep it alive for you. It's purpose built for cultural heritage. Uh, the GCI and the World Monument Fund um, has paid for its development over the course of five to seven years, um, specifically around uh, built works. Um, they were with cultural heritage inventories, um, but we're using it in many different ways today. Uh, and innovative, we try to do things um, that aren't just the same as traditional relational databases. Because if we were doing that, we would just use a traditional relational database. So we are trying to do things using semantic technology that sometimes gets us in trouble uh, in terms of development time, but at the end, uh, it'll be a better product for it. So to walk through, hopefully it's maybe visible, some of the features um, of Arches at a core level, and then what, where we're going to go with um, Disco. So Arches has sort of an ontology and uh, model management feature where we can say, when we are talking about activities, we know that we want to have a name for that activity, and the name has some content, and this is going very far down now into the text. Uh, there are other texts about that uh, activity, it was carried out by a person, it took place somewhere, it's part of some other activity, and, and so on. So we can see in the sort of administrative view of uh, Arches, the details of how we're going to do the modeling, um, even down to, you know, it's P1 is identified by 
and the class is E3341 linguistic appellation. If that is not a mouthful, then I don't know what it is. So usability-wise, we would never expose that to an end user. Um, that's only for us internally. Indeed, what we expose is name. Uh, there's also vocabulary management. So of course, um, we have different types of activity. Uh, currently, we've defined three. Project, research task, and experiment in that order of uh, partitioning hierarchy. So it's all activity. We don't use a different subclass. We say there, were, there was an activity and it has type experiment uh, to distinguish it from a, uh, from a project. Uh, and then you can see you know, you've got all these other AAT entries for the different dimension types, different types of identifier, different languages, different materials, different types of name, and so on and so on and so on. So we can manage the, the vocabulary, the terminology that we use uh, in the same way as managing the, the model that we use. We put those two together and we can generate uh, editing interfaces automatically. So this is a, you know, all I have done to generate this is write these little snippets to say uh, thing used to perform this activity. So of course that's used P16, used specific object. Uh, and then from that you'll get a pop-up of, you know, did you use this scanner or that scanner? Um, so, and then you can have defaults. So if I didn't enter English, it's just in the system that I speak English and that the language of the, pro language of the project is English. So it's going to populate all of these defaults so that you don't have to do it yourself. So here we have a name. It's got some content, degradation of plastic by acetone. The type of name is the preferred name for this project, and it's in English. And then I click add. So we've tried to make it as easy as possible for someone used to entering data into web forms like this and to build semantic data without realizing they're building semantic data. Similarly, we can take that data and generate a report. So here is the you know, hypothetical Van Gogh project, and you see it's got that same you know, preferred term, language, English. Maybe we'd hide those fields in the report because it's obvious that it's in English. And it's the first one, so it's obvious it's the preferred name. But there you go. Then similarly, name VG, so our short internal name for it could be VG. It's not the preferred one, so it just says type of name, yes, yeah, not filled out. Here's the type, it's a project. Uh, there's a statement about it, the great conservation project. This is a description, uh, and it's an English, and so on and so on and so on and so on. So this also just happens automatically by archers. You don't need to, well, what you can figure is these labels, and then it <coughs> fills it out. So what we are doing with DISCO is to take archers and apply it to conservation science. So DISCO is archers for science. Uh, it is a data management platform um, for conservation science. We use like CRM uh, and IIIF that I'm not talking about today, but we're also involved with it's an international image interoperability framework. Uh, it has the same sort of principles and it uses linked open data in a way that no one actually realizes they're doing linked open data for images. Um, and it's used by now thousands of institutions around the world. Uh, so what do we want to do? Um, improve the preservation and discoverability of conservation science data reducing the need to repeat experiments and subject our precious objects to the process <coughs> of conservation. Uh, to allow controlled access to the results, you know, some we want to keep internally, some we want to publish, so Arches is very good at allowing that sort of thing. Um, we're doing it in a, mul a multiple phase approach. We want to get to a minimum viable product that conserva conservation scientists can use and feel like there is more to be done, but can use. Uh, is the first point. Uh, and then once, they, once we get feedback to say we also need to be able to do this and then we can then uh, iterate and uh, improve it uh, based on that usage rather than based on hypothetical needs uh, in a uh, sitting around a conference table. Um, and probably most important is the recognition of the importance of the scientist's time uh, and this is really the main drive of DISCO, uh, that we want to make it easy to put data in in the 
time available and in the method most convenient to the person doing it, not to the programmer. So what we have been doing is focusing on workflow. So instead of saying you have to go in and create a new activity and then you type it as a project, instead we have these sorts of cards of saying you know, create a new project. And as part of that workflow, you'll define the group of people that are working on the project and you'll add members into that, uh, you know, add people into that group. You'll probably describe the, the project, you'll describe the group, describe the people, um, if they're not already in the system. So it's not a sort of a per class approach that um, Vanilla Arches takes, uh, but instead an overlay on top of it to guide people through um, this is what we want to end up with, uh, rather than leaving it to um, the user to figure out. Or once you've created your project, you know, create a new sample, create a new data set, create a new sampling activity, create a new dot, 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 dot. Um, whatever the scientists need um, to document, at the time that they want to be doing it, that's, what, that's how we'll configure the, the workflows. <coughs> the workflows, it's a bit dim, uh, but look just like the rest of it. You know, you've got drop downs, you can put in your rich text description, you can give it a name, you can give it a start date, and so on. Um, and then the, you know, this is step one of three identify project and its objectives. Step two will be then you know, create a group, add members to it. Step three, you know, dot, dot, dot. Uh, we also want to have um, data set visualization, at least initially for two-dimensional data. So um, there is lots of good uh, chart generating widgets for uh, the web, for, for browsers. So we want to be able to say, you know, given these results, select one of them, know the axes and plot the data. Um, so this is review data step, step four of four, something to do here. So once you, when, when you're making a data set, when you're making a data set from the previous report, you know, the last step is look at it and say, yep, that's what I was expecting. So we want to work with data, not just metadata or meta, meta, meta data. Um, this is where AAAF comes in. Uh, we know full well that it's hard to actually define features or the, uh, the region of interest um, and that the way that we all do that uh, is by annotating images, not by somehow defining the exact location on the physical thing. So um, you know, here is a, a slice and this is the bit that we're talking about. So uh, from this user interface and from managing the annotations, we can then create the features that are then talked about by the modifications and other activities. So rather than trying to have someone describe in, in words this bit, we, we link it up with, uh, with annotations. So, uh, in summary, um, linked art is a linked open usable data application profile of Site CRM. Um, it's focused on artworks uh, and we want to reach out and ensure that we interoperate with other efforts, such as this one, uh, for when, uh, when it's appropriate and, and possible, so that we are not introducing conservation terms and so on. Uh, and Thanasis is uh, very, very grateful to Thanasis for agreeing to be one of the co-chairs in the SIDOC SIG for with that. And so we're, we're confident that it'll be like this, rather than like this. Um, community engagement and implementation is sort of the top priority. Uh, that um, one of the issues that we've seen with the CRM over the years is um, it's seen as this big complex monstrosity that no one can ever understand. And it's not really true. Um, it just takes a bit of effort uh, in teaching and um, understanding and simplifying. Not simplifying what we can say, but simplifying how we say it. Uh, we are using Arches, uh, it's an open source platform for heritage data management, uh, focused on standards. Um, so this is one of, this is the Getty approach to the uh, implementation question, we're using uh, Arches. And for conservation science, uh, we are doing DISCO, which is the project to implement conservation science on top of Arches, uh, with the emphasis on these workflows uh, and making it as usable as possible for the 
conservation scientists rather than for the developers, because the developers have their usability back at the beginning uh, with the linked out model. So, thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to try and answer them. Feel free to come up and because you want to. Yes. Yeah, we can still take uh, five minutes. Five minutes yeah. too, I think Dominic needs sound as well. So we yeah. 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 Please. Um, well, I, mean, I was thinking whether you could say a couple of things um, rather about the interaction with the conservation scientists yeah. and how it's found. I mean, how obviously we have presented some of that. Uh, progressed quite a bit. How did you get to that stage? <laughs> yep. <Yeah. laughs> yeah. yeah. So the project has been planned for quite a long time, um, and we had a uh, before my time at the GT, there was a workshop um, that the Conservation Science um, Institute uh, put together, I think, in 2014, and brought a bunch of folks. I'm not sure if you know what you were there, but no. Um, someone from LC was different. Yeah. Um, to sort of get an understanding of the field and figure out, you know, is this something that we should do for ourselves or is this something that we should do with a view to making it more useful for others? Uh, and I think at that point at least the, uh, the very widespread agreement was that there wasn't something like this that had this sort of feature set that, would, um, that was available. Um, so uh, more recently, um, in fact really this year, uh, we started drilling down and doing the modelling and selecting the vocabularies and, and so on. The way that we've done that is mostly through, um, well, essentially what we'll be doing this afternoon. <laughs> uh, they're sitting down with flip pads or a whiteboard and saying, okay, let's, let's talk about your, what your activities are and what you want to be able to capture. So uh, we have, for example, um, sat in a room and said, well, what does a project look like to you? And you know, the scientist said, well, we have a project, and then you know, we do stuff. Well, what stuff? <laughs> well, we do experiments, okay? Draw a bubble experiment. <coughs> and the project is, that's just uh, lots of experiments. So, well, no, 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 we have these research questions we're trying to ask. Uh -huh. You have a research task, uh, and so on. Um, and that's has been useful for two reasons. One, to inform the scope and the, the strategy for the work, but also as a teaching exercise for the scientists to see how we think about what they are doing. And um, we digital folks think about what they are doing. Yeah. Um, so the bubbles started off reasonably vague but then go down to the next level and say, okay, but let, me, let me say it back to you. You have projects that consist of um, research questions, that consist of experiments, that consist of observations, comparisons, modifications, and then writing up reports. I said, yeah, that's exactly what we do. All right. And ta-da, we have suddenly come up with one of my slides of you know, this is how we broke down the activities. Uh, and that's been successful, I would say, uh, on both fronts of um, defining the scope for the work uh, and for having the scientists grasp what we are trying to what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And in terms of uh, future plans, how how far do you see that extending into the conservation? I mean, the conservators in the, in yep. the, in the team. Yeah. So, and the end goal, of course, is to be able to record. Um, not just the science, but also yeah. the yeah. conservation actions that the science you know, descri describes how they should be done. Um, however, it's a GCI project mm -hmm. as opposed to a museum project, so the emphasis is on the science, not on the conservation actions. Um, once we get the science part done to a, a usable extent, then I think we'll sort of engage more heavily with conservators to say, okay, now, when you are doing things and you're looking at the science or the, you know, the experiments from 
the GCI folk, you, know, you do a conservation action, and you're using these other results. Yes? Okay. Bubbles, 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 bubbles. Yep. Um, and we'll see the extent to which they are then willing to participate and the workflows that they need to make it easier for them to participate. Uh, yeah, that's sort of phase three, I think. But yeah, we are currently a quarter of the way into the first phase of getting the, you know, the basic conservation science system to be usable by, by people, not by me. <laughs> no? Um, is, there's a big focus on sampling, mm -hmm. and are they using the term sampling as in we have a non-invasive analysis that was done? Because we, <laughs> yes. we generally are looking at it from yep. that perspective, not, it's more so that mm -hmm. than physical sampling. Yep. So, and this is one of the times when the bubbles made a very big difference. So, um, the oh, Dominic's really put on. So, in the when we had sampling and sample, uh, that mock-up of a screenshot was um, from before the modelling work, and just more sort of, is this the sort of thing that you want to do? Yeah, uh, and it was when we were confused as to what sampling meant and had conflated the definition of an area and the removal of a sample. So hence we just had sampling. Uh, and now, after we've gone through the more um, granular exercise of saying, okay, what do you do? Now we have two different things. One is removal of a sample and one is definition of the area of interest. Uh, so yeah, one. The, the screenshot with the annotation is the definition of the area of interest and sampling, usually the removal of a sample from a larger object, would just be a description of the activity rather than necessarily an annotation on an image. And you were talking about doing the annotation in AAA here, mm -hmm. but you're not doing that from a rendition of the object to say the approximate geospatial location of this <laughs> observation <laughs> right. was. So what we Is hope, still a, yeah, a yeah, what we hope to do, well, one of the, one, I think one of the open questions, even for CRM, let alone for us, is how to describe the relative positions of objects and samples and features. Uh, you can say borders with using place, or you can say you know, near. <laughs> but how do you how do you say it was this, and then in the next stratum there was that. I don't, I don't know how to do that. Yeah, so, the challenge we had was like you could do an XY coordinate from your image of that yeah, object, yeah. but when you're using a different instrument, it's not it's going to be different. perfect. So exactly. I've had a yeah. conversation with Lee Robson about that because there's not any real way to do that. Yeah, so this isn't, yeah, no, no, this is a. <laughs> still to be solved. Yes, <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, no, so the, the approach that we're taking really is make, at that level, is to make it visible to humans to see what's happened. Uh, and then down the line, once we've got the technology that will be able to make it accessible to machines, then we'll sort of go back and say, okay, what can we do to extract the information from the annotations and you know the relative positioning based on the images versus the physical, et cetera, et cetera. We'll see if we can sort of retrofit the, the better model to come on top of what we're creating now. But we, so it's in, it's in our mind, but it's not a direct goal of the current work to solve. And I said one more question, yeah. the big challenge which is the temporal, so I know it's a research project, but we often have multiple come back four years later or something, which is still a challenge in that continuum, so yeah. we can talk at some other point, but uh, yeah, that's one that I think we still struggle with a little bit of how you, initially we talked all about daisy chaining, but we want to actually go back to the original project rather than yeah, creating a new project, which is the continuation of the previous one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like a long yeah. Work for yeah. yeah. One of the interesting things with CRM is that activities have one time span. So, if it is, and there is continuations, but if you want, if yeah, either you are going back to the project and creating a new one, which is a continuation of it, or the project is still ongoing. And it's, yeah, we could then say there was a larger project 
that consisted of two sub projects. This one had that time period and that one had that time period, but yeah, then you would want this super project. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. Okay. Any other ones? There's time for other questions. That's yep. Good. Right. Thank you. Uh,